欢迎大家回来现场。我们接下来要介绍的这一位策展人是瑞穆德斯·马拉萨斯卡。他是一位策展人与作家。一九五五年至两千零六年之间，他任职于维尔纽斯当代艺术中心，策划过“黑市世界”为主题的展览。二零零五年的时候，他是第九届波罗的海三年展策展，他在里面做了两集的电视节目，呃，叫做 CAC TV。他亦参与规划二零一二年第十三届德国无间展，以及一三年的第五十五届威尼斯双年展立陶宛与塞浦路斯联合馆。那马拉萨斯卡的策展计划呢？探讨新形态的艺术实践如何成为新的展览制作方式。他曾经制作过像是降临会的形式，或者是个人秀的表演方式，用这样子的方式来制作展览。那他也参与许多独立制作的展览。他另外他也进行写作，而他的写作就像他的策展一样，有着广泛而丰富的面向，包含了当代艺术、音乐、文化、实物、历史，还有艺文或是时空旅行等。无论是在机构内或机构合作，或者是独立制作，马拉萨斯卡的策展总是充满了原创的方法，并且与今天、当下、过去和未来对话。今天的演讲，我们可以期待如马拉萨斯卡的方写作方法，或者是策展方式那样的多变有趣，或许将会有提案、有阅读，还有对我们的邀请。让我们欢迎他上台。Hello, and thanks so much. Thank you so much for uh, being here, and also for allowing myself to be here. It's uh, it's always a. I'm I'm sure for other speakers it's the same, and that there's a bit of a stage anxiety, um, and. Uh, and then you hear how you are being introduced. Thank you. And suddenly, like everything seems like more grounded. Okay, like it's it's not so it's not so bad. I can. <laughs> there is some kind of history. There is there are some projects done, and one does not have to start everything from the beginning, because this is how. Stage always feels to me that like there is this moment where you have to invent something from the very beginning, and so I would like to thank you for very interesting presentations and discussions. Like usually, I'm always I would not even say I'm I feel ambivalent about curatorial conferences. More like polyvalent, like lots of lots of different feelings involved about it because because of at least a couple of reasons. Uh, I think the whole figure of curator is overinflated. It's uh, over identified and. Uh, over over distributed over encompassing so there is lots of over and uh, at the same time being in a conference like this it's such a delight and uh just to listen and to witness like all kinds of different approaches to not just to curating, but to, to the world at large. And so I'm really like, I feel blessed in that respect just to, to be learning about so many different things from different parts of this part of the world. So it's a total bliss. Um, I would also like to thank uh, translators, because they are doing an enormous, amazing job in this whole event. And I uh, witnessed it with my own ears. And they always have to deal with something which is very simple. Either 
they get a presentation that is prepared in advance. Or they have to deal with a speech like this, which is, of course, rehearsed, but not known to the translators. And so I would like to thank translators in advance for what, how they're going to deal with this presentation. And I often think of myself in that position also, like, uh, what does it mean to have something what is fully prepared? Let's say, like David read an amazing, uh, what they call in American English paper. And uh, I learned a lot from that paper. And I know how it is, how it feels like dizzy to go with your paper. Just like, you know you have your paper and you know it has a beginning, it has an end, and you just flow into that paper and it holds you. And I also have some papers. I also have some <laughs> something to read. But the excitement of not knowing where to go is also very high. So to me, uh, not knowing where I will end up uh, by not reading something, because with reading you, I mean, there are also like ways of ending up somewhere like where you didn't want to end up, let's see. Uh, all kinds of things may happen. <laughs> but <laughs> with talking like I feel like there's even like a larger field of like uh, unknown what may happen because truly like it's such a thrill to not to know what will happen. And then how that not knowing what will happen or that whole unknown, let's call it a horizon. How does that horizon inform uh, what one does. That's why I also asked Pili how an uncertain, and future is never certain, but how that kind of uncertain, even more uncertain than, let's say, three months ago, Horizon informs like how he thinks in terms of curating and collecting and organizing things. So, to me, curating always starts in, 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 in this sort of place where like, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's usually a moment of the present. And it's the moment of everyday life. So in that sense, um, I find any element that is around us and inside us and on us, an entry point into something else, a possibility of getting somewhere else. So every surface in that respect is, is a portal. I don't know how it is for translators. Every, every surface, like anything can be a portal. Anything you touch can transfer you somewhere, somewhere else. And in that respect, I'm perhaps like, I have a certain sympathy to psychoanalytical methods, which means that like when you come to the psychoanalyst, probably, let's say in a kind of more like a contemporary version of it, you're not necessarily um, gonna go back to some kind of past. You may start speaking about anything that is just like anything that is present. So in that respect, let's say I could just like start speaking about a microphone. Because this microphone is what I'm holding now and it has very specific properties. It has very specific tactility. It has very specific history. Of course it has a big history. Now it already has a connection with my voice. Uh, 
I don't know where it was produced, but like, just to think of how many people's intelligence went into this object that is just there that, to amplify what I'm saying. I remember like, and to be honest, like, you no, know, I'm sure that like, so many people have done these kind of uh, monologues about microphone that they are holding. Uh, one of those monologues was in Documenta 13 that I was involved. And um, I was organizing talks about scientific objects that were from the museum, and they were called black boxes because none of the museum uh, curators knew what those objects were. They were just there in a storage. And it's just simply like they were either parts of something that ended up there by chance or somehow like uh, nobody had time to really identify those objects. And so I was organizing talks about five of those objects once a week where invited people would come and just like try to speculate about it. And in one of those talks, I think it was Paul Chan that was in this role of like holding a microphone. And Paul just like started to riff on, on the microphone. And I think the, 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 whole, the whole discussion was about the microphone at the end. And so in that sense, like, I think one can curate entire biennale on just like starting with this microphone and without actually talking, just like using this microphone as a object of or constellation of so many material, social, political properties and factors. And that microphone can just like take you to so many different places depending on how, how you hold it and what happens with it. In 2007, as a response to the invitation, to your beautiful invitation, I was thinking of presenting one of those projects that uh, you make them, they are produced, they are circulated somewhere, and a couple of years later you forget about them. Like, actually, you forget them. I forgot about this project. And now I'm more and more keen on, like, pulling out something that I'm not anymore aware of. So this is one of those projects. It's, um, in 2007, I was invited by a magazine in Belgium to curate uh, an issue for, uh, for Documenta in 2007. And back then I was very true in your introduction. You said like time travel. I was quite fascinated with time travel. Then I stopped. <laughs> but back then I invited a group of people to make proposals for document exhibition. The twist was that you could make those proposals for any documenta in the past or in the future. And my uh, curiosity was about how would people whose thinking I'm inspired and whose thinking I respect and fascinated by, how they would respond to this kind of invitation. Let's say if you're invited to make a proposal for uh, Taipei Biennale in 2007, or 2006, one of those. So what would you do in, in order, let's say, and of course immediately like some kind of thinking of changing history comes in because let's say why would you go to the past to change something there that perhaps like will change something of how you are at the moment or 
how somebody will be in the future. So to me, this sort of like a very speculative, uh, um, let's say light-handed approach was what made me to email a group of people and ask them to make those proposals. And with Dexter Sinister designers in New York, they made a template, something like this, like a PDF file. So people would receive this PDF with a blank pages for years and then signature and sign also like you could identify the time that you are signing so let's say you could you could choose that maybe you're making something for documenta 5 but you're doing it from 2046 So it's, it's a sort of like a fictional exercise. And some people, were, some people were really good. And some people were even better. But there was no any kind of like, um, I don't think it had any like um, pragmatic consequences. This proposal <coughs> was shelved after I died unexpectedly in 2021. Now I have again reached an age where I'm able to curate this exhibition and all of the other elements are also in place to execute this idea. The project is based on the works of the American theorist Donna Haraway and it was conceived in 2015 after the passing of her companion, Cayenne Pepper. When that dog died, it was clear that grief could be assuaged by the simple process of cloning. Later, when Haraway was preparing for death, it was equally clear that a fascinating possibility was presenting itself to extend her work beyond the arbitrary confines of the grave. To put it simply, I spliced some of the theorist DNA with, hat, with that of her favorite animal companion and created a beautiful, highly intelligent mongrel. The exhibition proposal itself is simple. A virus was released in 2017, which affects proteins on the surface of human brain cells called cannabinoid receptors. The proteins are most dense in regions of the brain involved with thinking and memory, attention and control of movement. The virus induces an extreme form of synesthesia in E common. It can be spread through the exchange of bodily fluids, a basic kiss or the lick of an affectionate animal is enough to pass it on. However, the effects of the virus remain dormant until act activated by an encounter with a fish toxin from the Red Sea flatfish Pardahirus mamoratus. The virus was deliberately released in the international art community where, of course, kissing is one of the most prevalent habits and it's now estimated that at least 85 of the total population of Europe has been infected. Numbers are hazier for worldwide penetration. The exhibition will consist of two rooms. In the first, there will be a genealogy of early robotics. A collection of some of the key robotic arms has been secured for loan, including the Unimate, Rancho, Tentacle, and Scara arms. Stanford's first mobile robot, Shaky, is also available for loan. In the second room, Donna Cayenne 4, that's the name of the dog, well, it's the name of the mongrel. In the second room, Donna Cayenne 4 
will welcome visitors and encourage them to eat sugar lump dosed with a fish toxin. At that point, the otherwise empty room will be transformed for the majority of the audience. Although the synesthetic effect is extreme, walls will appear to melt in strawberry trumpet blasts, for instance. It persists for no more than seven hours. The catalog for the exhibition will be a mutated tomato impregnated with a historical text by Timothy Leary, Terence McKenna, Bamba Fausto, and a newly commissioned essay by Theresia Amba Odudoye entitled Dragons and Unicorns. The dog is in a kernel and all is well. This is a proposal by Francis McKee. And so when I was going through this publication, like somehow this one, like at this moment to me resonated quite, quite uh, vividly because of its like uh, sheer, uh, sheer Im Im imaginative flight and also at the same time like light, ha light ha handedness. It's light. And I, I really like the idea of tomato as a, as a catalog of the exhibition. Mutated tomato, impregnated with historical texts. Um, another proposal that also somehow resonated. What I'm actually showing now is, uh, it's a work by Alana Narbuteta, who is an artist in Vilnius in Lithuania. And I think this work sprang also from the conversation where I asked her whether she could conceive something that could be uh, running in presentations like, like now. Let's see, what would be a screen-based flow that is not presenting something which happened or that will happen and that is totally screen-based? Let's say it's not a sculpture, it's not a piece of text. Because, to be honest, like, that's why I'm also like, I'm, I think we should have more, more artists also talking in a conference like this, because they often have like a bit of a more, how to say, imminent approach uh, of actually presenting work, presenting artistic thinking uh, within these parameters. And that's why I think Paul Chan was so keen on just like riffing on the microphone rather than just like um, talking about factories where the microphone was produced. But of course the microphone brings you to those factories inevitably. And so this work is just something that has a presence and it has a certain sensual, I think, uh, call it channels. Channels to with you who are in, in, in this room. This is a proposal for document um, the current one. And it's signed in 2007 by Sturtevant. And what it says, I don't know if it's clear. Appearance is temporality. Not being there is essence. And I guess this is Sturtevant's take on, on something like Documenta. And um, this was sent by a fax. I still have that fax a sheet of paper. 
and it remains as like one of those. Uh, it also could be a tool, a bit like a microphone, like again, like a building an exhibition or building a project based on this one page. I think is as as relevant as building an exhibition on the history that is somehow modulated and articulated differently, or building an exhibition on the microphone, or building an exhibition on on the individual artist's work, uh, or building an exhibition on some kind of narrative. So this is where I find it really interesting to be in this field. It is to be in within like a very uh, different uh, and not necessarily uh, complying with each other narratives and ways of thinking. And uh, I forgot who was talking about it actually. I think yesterday. It's also like what was being spoken about yesterday, it so much informs, let's say, how, what I can speak about today. And this is also what we were talking with Jibish about, how curating is actually uh, about finding movement from one thing to another, rather than isolating something and celebrating that sort of like a singularity of the thing. It's much more about how one thing informs, let's say, how you move from one corner to another corner, and actually you, you simply, like, you, you move through different worlds, but you also, you move those worlds. And so, what everybody was speaking about yesterday is simply like a path for me to go through, and I don't know how, what it brings to Aileen, but this is, this is to me a kind of the main, perhaps the main uh, stance what cur curating can do is first to not to be not to be holding to singularity of an isolated object, whatever that object is, and perhaps, and I'm not sure whether it's true, also to be more attentive to someone else rather than just your own subjectivity and your own your own individuality because I understood only like later on because curating to me was accidental I was involved in it by accident in a way and in the beginning I didn't really understand what I was doing probably still don't do <laughs> but what I understood, which was a kind of like, no more like an existential realization that this was a great opportunity and an invitation to be more attentive to someone else than just yourself. Because artists, I think especially with neoliberal arts education, nowadays artists are so, let's say I would not want to be in that kind of position of an artist where you feel that you are the center of some sort of uh, subjectivity that is not accountable to anyone else and everybody is accountable to you. So in that sense, curating in a kind of, whether it's like you know, in a logistical end of it, administrative end of it, or which could be as creative as anything else, or whether you are, let's say, in a more poetic, uh, drifty realm, Still, it's about uh, respecting and uh, honoring something outside of yourself. And perhaps like any, any psychoanalyst would now cut me through and would say like, what do you mean outside of yourself? What does it mean? Is there any outside? And I think this is where I will pass to the next speaker. Thank you so much for listening.
好，我们谢谢马拉萨斯卡的演讲。现在不知道要不要看讲稿才好。我们要介绍这个论坛的最后一位讲者了啊、嗯，是艾琳·黎加斯比·拉米雷。他是一位来自菲律宾的艺术学者，现任教于菲律宾大学迪里曼分校艺术学院。他近期的研究与文章发表专注于东南亚的策展与艺术历史上。他担任亚洲文献库顾问委员。洛培兹博物馆策展顾问，菲律宾文化中心、菲律宾艺术百科全书的修订本的副主编，新加坡期刊《South East of Now》编辑之一，网络平台《Another Roadmap School》监督委员，同时也是非营利艺术组织 Panau Nasin Bayang 主席。在全球这个混乱的时刻，策展实践有其提出质疑、不同意见或叙事的能力。以及艺术史建构和评论与论述在其中的重要性。今天他的演讲将来自于2004年《齐廷炫：寻求一种正常化的艺术史》，以及2011年《诺拉泰勒：无历史的艺术》两本书的启发，并进一步透过昨日讲者郑大卫的研究提出策展实践。透过展览制作与平台建立。他想提出，可以如何不再回避历史，而是与艺术文化的历史共存。黎加斯比拉米雷将以2014年和他的伙伴 Claro Ramirez 的 Offsite Out of the Site 这个低经费、非机构内策展的计划来作为案例，探讨在历史事实或去历史根据的脉络中。过程性的策展计划，行够了什么样的艺术史，以及我们要如何更大胆地去透过策展实践来重构历史？就让我们欢迎最后一位讲者。Good afternoon.、Um, I'd like to thank、um, NCAF, TFAM, and the very lovely people of the Cube Project Space for bringing me here. It's been a very、um, pleasant experience. Um, so I will take the baton that has been passed to me by Raimundas and、um, start with a little bit of revelation. My training is both in journalism and in art history, and I'm now in academe.、Um, and in all those three contexts, but particularly the last two, I have very conflicted、um, feelings about where I'm at.、Um, so I also have baggage of my past. Um, laying over what I'm saying, at the risk of preaching to the choir, let me offer this talk as essentially a plea for counting on history in the curatorial toolkit, primarily as recall go-to, an anti-amnesia and post-truth times, if you will. Now that so many leaders and their groupies remain keen on fueling war, propping up dictatorships, and making difference a reason to kill and refuse basic rights. It's indeed tragic that too many today are intent on forgetting, and making up the past in the most blatantly self-serving and incongruous ways. This is sadly true in the Philippines, as so many of my、uh, countrymen want to、um, re-envision what martial law was like, and in many other sites across the planet now, with each site of ominous occurrence of forgetting no one's in its own way. We need not dwell too long on the pulse points in this broadened notion of region or spatial remit. There is Hong Kong, and how、um, people are still sometimes baffled about how to read its protest movement.、Um, there's Taiwan's own、um, navigating its stories to also get past、uh, hand-centric narratives.、Um, uh, there's Indonesia tangling with. Uh, Papuan autonomy and how an how anti-corruption and criminalization should、um, proceed. There is China with its relationship with its、uh, Uyghurs. So、um, we could go on and on. Of course, incong incongruity and complexity are standard fare in the work of the intrepid curator. Rax Media Collective used Thicket as a stand-in for that on our first day.、Um, so we get to cheat because we're speaking on the last day. So again, I would have to say, if it will ever matter the most,、um, this just might be that precious moment in which, at which we ought to be called to task as curators, along with the other multiple hats that 
come with the donning of curatorial dress. We tell, or at the very least, we insinuate doubt. Our endeavors enable us to proffer other stories apart from what already circulates as unquestionable and forever in the ether. The shaping of scripts and propelling of narrative is at the core of putting together an architectural structure for many curatorial enterprises. By effecting a necessary and healthy irreverence for what is given and already known, the platforms we occupy and expand our reach from allow us to go out on a limb and invite beholders to come with us on a journey, to at least tentatively consider the possibility of a rehang of what has become sacrosanct or self-evident. In the interest of attempting to take this somewhat full circle, let me refer back to David Te, who lent his voice as one of the several keynotes here. Te, in his compelling book on Thai art from 2017, persuasively argues that the specter of nation insinuates itself even on the most avowedly post-nation of ventures, and of course, any project in this field, even minimally laced with notions of regionalism and contemporaneity, becomes potentially subject to that. Yet at the same time, Te in his writing consigns both criticism and art history to inevitable obsolescence, where he says, for it hardly seems incumbent on cosmopolitan critics or curators to familiarize themselves with such art histories lying far from sight, let alone those in exotic languages or those handed down but not written down. And to that, I would say such a dose of skepticism is clearly justified, given that too many sins have been visited upon the public consciousness by those flippantly crafting criticism and art history, fields that arguably still serve adjunct functions within curation. Nonetheless, this leaves us with a rather unfashionable premise to deal with in this talk. If the obsolescence of criticism and art history is undeniable, why should we trouble ourselves now? Let me try to persuade you that as we speak, there are ongoing conversations and writing happening, even as they are posed as conjectural. Some of these instances have been cited here, um, Havana, various um, installments of Documenta, Guangzhou, ventures that have seriously attempted to situate what they do in regard to history, politics, locality, predictively with variable degrees of success. Elsewhere in the uh, upcoming issue of Southeast of Now, uh, directions in contemporary and modern art, which I have the privilege of sharing idea bouncing time with a cohort of generous Asianist scholars. We have Singapore National Art Gallery curator and historian Phoebe Scott invoking a particular strain of cosmopolitanism, propelling the mobility of Vietnamese artists in Paris. Her essay suggests that the re-reading of what appears as a strain of anti-modernism is conflated um, by both patriotism and a desire to exercise stake over coveted space and place. I would argue that such carefully considered leverage or highlighted stab at agency by or among artists is what history allows us to sense. But this would be something totally overlooked by curators who might opt to only look at objects from a lens blindly anchored on a singular idea of now and thus be about the unproductively fleeting and dispensable. Still elsewhere and from 15 years back, the US-based historian Joanne Key in a 2004 essay called A Call for a Normalized Art History, which appeared in Asia Art Archive's dialogue, made a strong case for returning to an accountability to the work, particularly in the case of Kasuo Shiraga's pieces being awkwardly and conceptually flattened through references to Jackson Pollock. Key was arguing for turning again to the art object in all its necessary problematics. Such a task is also arguably something out of pace with today's rapid staging and gobbling of curatorial fare. How might we take that challenge and look at the work of curation as not some merely ministerial window dressing of sensual desire? How not to make the work merely about what we wanted to say? Another US-based Asianist, uh, Nora Taylor on the other hand, from a 2011 issue of Art Journal, put forward an implied charge to those of us who continue to curate and by default participate in historization. Taylor in Art Without History, Southeast Asian artists and their communities in the face of geography called on us to account for what and how we make art present. And in the course of that presencing, hopefully take stock of our deeds and see whether what has thus been engendered bodes engaging conversations that enable publics to deal with our currently intense and combustible plight of confusion and oppression. 
precisely because like most post-colonial sites, Asia continues to be associated with tropes of emergence, particularly in regard to contemporary art. Taylor also challenges us to think upon an expanded, albeit temporal and possibly flimsy notion of neighborhood and affinities, which may be born of grassroots artists' mobilization, as opposed to proto-laden and ceremonious geopolitics. To my mind, the Jogjakarta Biennale's framing of country pairings in reference to the equator is in keeping with this. More importantly, Jogja sets both art and artists, as well as visitors, off to sense social, historical, and spatial confluences, which make for denser reads that might be satisfying, not just sensorially, but in multiple dimensions. Apart from taking off from Taylor and Key, among others, I would, um, again, from his book, further egg us to explore even more possible kindred distance with this project. Um, what I see as calling out art history for being generally oblivious to local nuance and to easily subject to complicity with globalization's necessary evil of branding and flattening. For instance, and I'm, I'm not uh, putting you in a hot seat, David. <laughs> For instance, he says, my aim here is to give um, Thai relational practice a history it doesn't want. Not an art history, but a cultural history that has shaped its professional molds, yet lies hidden from those who lubricate its international circulation. Perhaps dangerously veering towards generalizations, we might suggest this gesture would be prudent to attempt across territories because lubricating is certainly what we end up doing by moving in these international circuits. We participate in the self-perpetuation of our practices and keeping those channels hospitable to our presences. Undeniably, curation is about making present. Though it is the possi uh, sorry, through it, the possibility of exposing the seams of history through what we do in exhibition making, platform making, and the other curatorial variants of our practices perhaps become more purposeful. How might we, um, through curation, enable art history to be uh, a less suspect rendering? What would such added burden mean, though, in regard to the curator's indomitable infidelity, lightness of foot, and near rabid independence? We ask ourselves such questions today in quite tenuous moments where Hong Kong's anti-deportation come independence movement propels itself steadfastly while remaining essentially uh, rudderless, but nonetheless dogged. Where the ability to realize dream projects often becomes a tug and pull between yielding some desperately crafted distance from institutional mangling through dangled state support translating to art washing. How does the curatorial impulse speak or at least attempt a conversation with such impurities on the horizon? In the abstract for this talk, I did indicate how particularly in keys and Taylor's texts, we specifically, those working in and on Asia, seem to still be stumped or held back by nearly two decade old questions relating to superficial inclusion and tact, tact on reductionist thematics. This is not to say that there have, haven't been victories or breakthroughs. Um, and it behooves those of us who are able to take breathers from the career rat race to cheer on even flailing attempts. Perhaps I would work uh, up to end this talk by invoking a personal project um, that uh, works, uh, at, that evokes process and contingency, the not knowing perhaps that Raymond was also um, referencing. Um, it continues to weigh heavily on how our work referring, and I'm referring to our, uh, including Clara Ramirez, um, who uh, one constitutes part of um, Back to Square One, actually the artistic director. Um, and this is something we've, uh, we, st we started in 2005. So um, doing this project basically marked our shifting away from a wholly more institutional curatorial practice to a far less fettered and under-resourced one, while confronting no less ca complex capes of contending interests. My intent in ending this way is also a gesture not only to consider documentation as being very much a part of, his, of historicizing um, or inscribing ourselves into history, but to see how we might invoke a critical stance to that documentation and not just use it to help us get the next gig that rises on the horizon. So how can our self-narrativizing contribute to a more critical art history? Um, so the project, off-site, out-of-site, um, took 
place on tw uh, began in 2014. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be showing a video, a video documenting um, some of what happened uh, in this project. But I will mute the sound and I will speak over the video. And I'm deliberately doing that to be able to evoke two planes of co conversations, um, possibly uh, doing contrarian telling at the same time. Okay. Um, so at the moment I teach, and thus I'm institutionally anchored in the University of the Philippines, um, where the project took place. So UP, an American colonial period tertiary institution with over 100 year old history of pedagogic influence. The project is cited uh, there. Um, UP is a major landholder in Quezon City, um, where it occupies close to 500 hectares of property, within which by 2006 had 70,000 informal settler families residing. Uh, some of those families predating UP's moving into the property. A specific and tight-knit group of these settlers living in a sub-area called Cruz Naligas have been asserting land claims versus UP. This only recently seems to have been rectified and decided in favor of that sub-community. The video, by the way, is by Michelle Lua and Jake Pimenta, who are among the many artists who participated in this project. Offsite, out of sight consisted of profoundly soul-wrenching work. In a very real sense, it was about working with pre-existing spaces and pre-existing publics very much entwined with charged histories. We, click, we quickly realized as we began oculars and community research that we were initially perceived as would-be usurpers, given that anyone associated with the university may have been sent as undercover pre-demolition surveying teams. Our hope was to carve out common spaces within the campus amidst the informal settler enclaves, some of which had been fenced off to deter even more settlers coming in and building more permanent structures. It was Clara who found the site we would eventually work in. This was a former national stud farm for elite horses that by that time, we, um, the time we were doing research for offsite, had already been transformed many times over as squatting spaces, a place to do drugs, a literal dumping ground. Eventually it became a materials recovery facility with goats running free. But more importantly, the axis, it was the axis of at least three sub-communities of settlers where children and adults cut through to get home from work or school near UP. In the course of negotiating with the institution, we learned to phrase our speech in the language of pedagogic work, opening up workshop spaces, offering de facto extension opportunities for teachers and students, staging immersion um, activities, etc. At the beginning, both the institution and community uh, uh, we were, were met us with much goodwill despite losing access to a competent and sympathetic community development complement. There's a change in administration in UP. Um, and this was very early on. Um, this kept us very much paralyzed at one point by the bureaucracy. Clara was the Pied Piper and ever optimistic in the team, I being the resident cynic. Community leaders initially, it seemed, were simultaneously suspicious then baffled. By the end, doing their own self-directed tours of the site, which uh, indicated to us that there must have been some very real ownership from, from their end uh, at that point. At the peak of the project, we were attracting kids and teenagers from outside UP to use the site for play. Biking, sk skating, signing up for a range of workshops loosely and sometimes very much um, uh, related to art, but they were undertaken by volunteer painters, poets, performers, photographers, etc., from both within and outside UP. The word got out, uh, and the site became a converging point for the academic community and those they had previously been oblivious to. So students and teachers uh, prior to this uh, pretty much ignored the, the, not only the site, but the amount of informal uh, settler communities that had been present. Unfortunately, we did not get, did not quickly enough pick up on how fractured the communities themselves were. There was generational dispossession and intra-community tensions, uh, and this became more and more real as off-site, out-of-site 
took shape and eventually went into the now meant a year and six months after. The university eventually shut us down, I would say rather cunningly and unceremoniously, as we were obviously becoming a nuisance in their containment efforts. My point in bringing this up is primarily about underlining the reality that the space and time for curatorial hubris never really comes with the luxury of ahistoricity. In fact, I wager this could be the moment to go beyond the overprivileged posture of the curator and to shift gears into performing more overt gestures to share. Um, more pointedly, disabuse ourselves of the illusion of control or curatorial sovereignty so that our co-agents in the ecologies we move in may indeed rec recuperate art and life from its bloated, uh, well, art with it, from its bloated sense of self. That, I believe, might help in the decolonizing ourselves as subjectivities bump against each other in these projects. Very much part of our jobs um, as curators is practicing the ability to speak in variant registers. Discursively, sensorially, theoretically, colloquially, we speak by invoking commonalities as often as we do. We do through evoking divergences and what is confounding. We may continue to imagine how able we are to thwart such many uh, moving parameters, but we are quickly disabused of our invincibility. Um, we step into a quagmire, no matter how shrewd we think we are and how good natured the proposition. Again, I bring up this project without intending to cast ourselves as some heroic duo dueling with windmills. On the contrary, what I had hoped is to do, what I hope to do is to turn on the lights upon the workings of both history, not just art history, and curation, particularly now when veiling and mangling are the operative modes of operation. How might we come clean about our foibles as well as gains so we can take the hindsight and try again? So here's to um, necessarily incomplete because partial history, possibly untidy and undone curatorial ventures that might just keep us more skewed towards some, um, some unkempt but needed honesty. And this is precisely and particularly in the case of projects framed within the context of participation and social engagement, where the degrees of contingency are high and the prospects of perpetuating inequitable relationships and structures remain far too, far too plausible. To my mind, one of the real challenges of doing work in the cultural sphere today is about effective candor in regard to the complications underpinning what we do. That, of course, can be attempted spatially, discursively, and experientially, um, counting on dynamic narrative flow, variable entry exit points, scenography. The bag of tricks is a deep well gushing forth because of seasoned interventions, not just by theorists, historian, critics, but by artists, designers, and mediators. It is that imaginative working together that makes contrarian voices bounce off the walls and dangerously push buttons among our publics, not just to consume what we make, but to hopefully come away moved to the point of live action. Quite obviously, I'm very inclined to say that curation participates in crafting art history, even when not overtly recognized as doing so. The question is, what kind of art history is being made in the process? Do we turn up the obvious and untroublesome, or ask the tough questions that might lead to our own embarrassment? Do we merely wet the inquisitive impulse or saturate our publics by the way we do things? By all means, let us not tire of exceeding the preset logics of structure and history, even as we still refrain from being foolish uh, enough to ignore context. Sometimes ahistoricity issues out of naivete, but also could be merely mercenary. I believe it is very much the curator's job to sniff out what is hidden under the veneer of the official, to hack away at what makes that impenetrable. Squeezing into institutional cracks is possibly where we can best be of use in this field of mystification. So my pitch is to keep our sense of time and space malleable, to stay creative, but to also keep an eye out for some way to return to navigational anchors. That may be the redemptive place of art history. I leave, with, leave you with a question inspired by what I've heard over the last two days here, uh, and this is how might we make curation more neighborly particularly in regard to how people are engaged and in how parallel practices such as art history, art education, etc., are not only begrudgingly lived with, but actually seen as healthily codependent. How not to just fan further facile antagonisms, but to mutually enable these channels of discursive visibility. 
while not consciously regurgitating um, what Xiao Yu Ling was uh, referencing, the Euro America 1990s Museums versus Academy to Art Histories formulation, where scholarship and aesthetics are pit against each other, and where supposedly context gets subsumed over exper experientiality of letting the art speak versus uh, evoking conversations through and around it. Still, I submit this is an opportune time uh, to underline the indispensability of research that is not merely about studio visits and networking for resources to get curatorial projects off the ground. Certainly, this is not some call to taking on affectations about curatorial sophistication for its own sake, but one that hopefully encourages a more agentive engagement. Um, we all need to weigh in on how history is made today or quit ranting about flawed memory. As curators, as well as social agents, we really ought to zealously guard the spaces opened up to us for calculated risk taking. Then we might be upfront with the odious histories we are subject to and hope to shape. Even as we hope to emerge wise and skate and skate to some healthy degree. Thank you. <laughs>